Ladies and gentlemen, we are now jumping into the first podium discussion. And before introducing the further guests, I would like to ask Ms. Guillaume Keller also back on stage. And then I would uh, like to present to you our guests in this uh, podium discussion. Please uh, welcome first uh, the Prime Minister of Romania, Mr. Victor Ponta. Welcome. Good morning. Let's have a seat. A warm welcome also to Ms. Michelle Sabon, who is the President of the Assembly of the European Regions and the President to the R20 Board. Welcome, Ms. Sabon. Warm welcome to Mr. Ian Johnson, the Chairman of the Carbon Ratings Agency and Secretary General of the Club of Rome. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. We have here tomorrow, this morning, Mr. Gustav Nobel, the chairman of the Nobel Sustainability Trust. Welcome, Mr. Nobel. Please join us on stage. We uh, want to welcome from the industry side, Mr. Gerhard Reuss, the CEO of OMV. Morning, Mr. Royce. Please welcome Mr. Eric Rondolat, the CEO of the lighting sector from Royal Philips Electronics. Good morning, Mr. Rondolat. And last but not least, definitely, please welcome Mr. Philip Schulz, expert leader on environmental energy and strategic raw materials from Renault Nissan Alliance. Good morning. I think you see this over there. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we all uh, heard some uh, very inspiring speeches uh, on stage this morning. And now I would like to start with you, Prime Minister Ponta, and ask you, can you please offer us an outline um, for the energy strategy in your country? What is going on there? Let us know in which way does Romania contribute to the common goal uh, with also with regional action? What's going on in your country? So, good morning. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to attend this conference. Having the floor after Governor Schwarzenegger, it's like fighting against him in his movies, so I have no chance. I just decided to die fast and uh, to have the shortest speech. And uh, to say that I'm here with two important goals. The first one, of course, is to promote my country, which is uh, a blessed country by its regional position and by its natural resources. Uh, we have important investors, OMV is uh, next to me all the time, even in the country, and uh, a lot of opportunities. But I also came here to learn and to find the answers for uh, some questions, which I think all of us we have, we have, we must have. And we have to say to the people, what is the cost of this clean future? And we have to convince the people. And I was inspired by, by the enthusiasm and the explanation that Governor Schwarzenegger gave. Uh, by the way, I, I told to my son, he's 10 years old, and I told him I'm going to Vienna to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger to speak about energy. And he told me, yeah, whatever, energy, ask him about the next movie. Uh, <laughs> I tried to explain him how important it is, but it's not always so easy as it seems to be here speaking with people who knows the subject and believes in this. So uh, I really need to learn how can we invest more, how can we develop more clean energy, but also what is the real cost of this and to convince people. When I mean the cost, I mean, first of all, the financial cost. Because many people in my country, of course, the poorer one, they say very often, we want cheaper energy, not necessarily cleaner energy. And it's our duty to convince them that cleaner energy on a medium and long term is the cheapest one, not only on financial, but even on all other kind of costs. The cost for the, for the environment, 
because my country is very rich in new sources of energies. But uh, on the other hand, there are concerns that exploring more the energy resources, it's a danger for the environment and for the future, not only of the country, the continent, the world. And I think that we have and we must have the, the answers for this. Last but not the least is the social cost. I represent in the national parliament a constituency, 100,000 people. They have always lived working in a, in a power plant which is based by coal energy. And uh, of course, they are very afraid of the wind energy. They, hand, they hate the wind turbine. They say this is going to, stay, to, to steal my jobs. And uh, I think that we must, we must have an answer for them, to explain them that new energy is not about losing jobs, it's rather about creating jobs and creating new opportunities. So uh, I'm going to use this conference for uh, trying to find out these answers. And uh, I'm going back home. I will uh, disappoint my son. I won't have the answer about the new movies of Governor Schwarzenegger, but I hope to tell him that we spoke here about his future, and this is the most important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Ponta. Um, very interestingly, uh, as talking about new opportunities, uh, Director Royce, um, this change in energy, energy mix, is it a chance for a company like yours? Is it a danger more? Or how do you think, which way will the whole thing go? For your company as well. Thank you. Let me first start with the hammer of uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's. You have seen in the movie at the beginning, uh, hydrogen filling station. And this is the first Austrian hydrogen filling station. So Mr. Schwarzenegger, when next time you come to Austria, bring your hammer with you, and it allows you to go to Schlaben in Graz or Kitzbühel. Uh, we have uh, opened our first hydrogen filling station in Stuttgart two years ago. This is one of our small initiatives to support hydrogen or immobility in Europe. Allow me a few words about uh, this uh, audience here. I think it's important to discuss what we heard small initiatives, big initiatives, regional initiatives, global initiatives, long-term, short-term initiatives. That's very important, and I would like to start with one European initiative in terms of energy mix, affecting our business, of course, and one more long-term initiative. OMV is an oil and gas producing company. We are aware that this transition period to clean energy has started years ago. What we are not aware of, how long this transition period will last. 30 years, 50 years, 80 years. What we know, here we take just the IE figures, that even in 20 years from now, renewable will have a share of 20, 25 percent, let's say 30 percent, maximum. This means oil and gas, we still have a share of 50 percent even in 20 years from now. And even if it's not very popular, allow me to say we also have to manage security of supply, to manage the availability of sufficient energy in this world. What we can do when we talk about fossil energy, we have to think about which energy inside fossil to prioritize. There's gas, for instance, available for the next 100, 200 years. The cleanest, by far the cleanest fossil energy. Do we see gas as a partner for renewable? Do we see gas as an enabler of renewable? Think about mobility, hydrogen mobility, CNG, gas mobility. Think about storage. 
Think about transportation, logistic. Think about what we heard about in the US example, running gas-fired power plants instead of coal-fired power plants. Take this US example. Nowadays, the cheap coal is exported to Europe, whereas in US, you're running your gas-fired power plants at full capacity. Europe is the contrary. Europe is increasing the coal burn. It's a real disaster in Europe. Would we in Europe use existing capacity of gas-fired power plants and run them by 85%, like you do it in the US? This would mean a reduction of CO2 out of power production by 30% per annum. This means 480 million tons of CO2. This is six times the total CO2 production of Austria. This is what can be achieved when we talk about Europe, I have to say, midterm, theoretically. Again, the question is, how do we see gas? How do we see gas in Europe? Is it a partner? Is it an enabler? Or do we keep our populistic approach against gas because it's fossil? as we have today. And if you see Europe, and you see European Roadmap 2050, Europe is not seeing gas as an enabler of renewable energy. Second topic. Uh, Mr. Royce, I just want to jump in a, a second here, because we are a little bit in a time problem here, and would like to gather a, a, a number of um, uh, questions, bring up a number of issues, so we can ask Governor Schwarzenegger before he has to leave. Is that okay with you? All right, we have the very interesting gas issue, maybe we should talk about uh, a little later, if there is enough gas to supply us for a long time. But uh, at this point, I would like also to bring in Mr. Rondolat, if possible. Please, can you outline the role Philips holds for the sustainable energy future? Sure. Um, so, so first of all, I would like to take a bit of, of distance and talk about uh, where the world is going. Uh, we believe that in the coming uh, 20 years, uh, energy consumption will double, while at the same time, we need to reduce CO2 emission by two. There's no way that we solve this energy dilemma if we don't change the way we do things. Extremely remarkably, you know, we're consuming energy in this room. One unit of energy consumed in this room requires that somewhere in Austria, a generation plant produces three units. So we believe that the name of the game when we talk about energy mix is not so much about producing more but consuming less. So energy efficiency is at the top of our uh, priorities. Of course, there are a lot of positive collaterals when we drive energy efficiency. 3% of energy efficiency until 2030 will prevent us from building 2,500 power plants, saving 2,000 billion euros, creating 6 million jobs, and potentially saving uh, 5 billion uh, of CO2. But beyond the statistics, because we've talked also about how, do we, how we can make things happen. And if we want to make things happen, we need to focus. So let me now focus on lighting. And why lighting? First of all, lighting is 20% of the worldwide electrical consumption. It is also 50% of the energy bill of municipalities. And at this point in time, with efficient lighting technology, we can go and save up to 80% of the energy consumption of lighting. And I'm not talking about outer space. I'm not talking about something that is going to be visible in 20 years. We're doing that today. Well, since we are in, in, in Austria, I cannot resist and to talk about what we did. Uh, in the Danube Island, where we implemented a full energy efficient lighting uh, solution. And we are saving indeed 80% on the energy consumption. To finish off, uh, inspired by uh, your great speech, I would like to come back to these people that don't have access to energy. And we would count in the world 1.6 billion people today that do not have access to energy. So how do we bring light to these people? And it is about 
uh, zero energy lighting solution. We call them solar uh, lighting solutions. And this is once again not something that is going to be available in 20 years. This is something that we are doing today. And we are implementing, we are deploying these solutions at this point in time in Africa. Uh, we are deploying them in Southeast Asia. We are deploying them in India. So, in a nutshell, the need is there. The technologies are there. I think the willingness is here. I mean, as a company, we're extremely happy uh, to be part of this initiative, of the R20 initiative, because we need to bring together companies, we need to bring together government, we need to bring together the actors that want to make this world a more sustainable one to make it happen. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> let's, let's at this point proceed from we had the oil and gas issue, we had the lighting issue. Uh, I think we should talk about the auto industry as well. And uh, Mr. Schultz, the question is, uh, in, you, in your industry, uh, people are talking about emission-free transportation. That it, sounds really interesting. What is that all about? Yeah, first of all, I think that we have to face a, a huge burden, which is the oil burden. You know that uh, today we have about uh, 95% uh, of the cars worldwide do use either gasoline or diesel fuel. And you know that uh, it means that we have uh, a fuel consumption worldwide of about 20 million barrels of oil, 20 million barrels of oil every day. So clearly we have to get, we, get, we don't have to get rid of that, but we have to decrease this very strong oil addiction. Clearly we know that gasoline and diesel fuel will remain uh, very important in the next future but we have to decrease this oil addiction. And then the second point is what you said. We have to make it emission-free. So clearly reducing, because in fact we have three, uh, three burdens to, uh, to, to address at the same time. We have the climate change address, we have the oil, uh, the oil bill, and we have at the same time also the emissions and health bill, which is very important as well in many cities. So how to address that at the same time? We think that there are many options open, such as hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but we think that we have also technology available now, which are zero emission cars, the electric cars. And we are very pleased to provide cars to uh, Governor Schwarzenegger uh, yesterday. And we think this is something which is available right now, because we have to develop cars uh, affordable for all, sustainable energy for all, to fuel sustainable mobility for all. And you know, uh, it's a very important strategy for the Renault-Nissan Alliance, and we're very pleased also to, uh, to have uh, uh, the Dacia brand in Romania very strong, developing very uh, highly fuel-efficient cars at the same time. We have to do that for everybody. You know, the car market grew from 50 million cars per year in the year 2000, up to 78 million cars last year, and it, would be, it could be something like 100 million cars by 2020. We have to change our business model. We have to change our business model and address at the same time those, uh, those tremendous challenges I mentioned before, health, so tailpipe emission reduction, CO2 emission reduction, and uh, getting progressively uh, rid of, of oil or as the only single fuel option, as the only single fuel option. 95% of the cars now use uh, oil-based fuels, so we have to decrease that progressively. And I think we have to start now, and we can start now because we have the technology. Thank you very much. It's an interesting um, uh, view, a new view, a different view, as uh, Mr. Royce just told us. Governor Schwarzenegger, we had a first round of people now talking about what they can contribute. What is, what is actually your opinion on the uh, gas issue Mr. Royce just uh, named uh, about is, can gas be a partner in this business or not? What do you think? You're talking about oil companies? Or yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think the most important thing is, in my opinion, that we don't villainize oil companies and that we don't villainize you know, coal or oil or any of those things. Because what we want to do is, we want to say, look, this really worked the last hundred years. It was fantastic. But we learned that it has tremendous side effects on our health. And we are killing people. So now we know better. And now slowly, 
we need to create and inspire companies to create the technology so we can get off that old system, that old way of powering things and find a new way. And there is new ways around. So it is just a matter of now the car manufacturers, their faith in the build cars, that the electric, that the hydrogen, and that the biofuels and all of those things, and to uh, make things more efficient. Like in California, we have passed laws after laws to force companies to make things more efficient. Like for instance, a flat screen TV that I talked about earlier. You can use an old model and it uses 80% more energy. We use in California, you use only 20% of the energy. So there's the light bulbs. I mean, like in Oslo alone, when they replaced the, the street lights, you know, they immediately reduced their energy use by 70%. So I think as you have said earlier, that the, you know, to reduce the consumption and the use of, of energy, we have to think about that, and that's why California is 40% um, energy efficient. But I think that is, uh, there is great partnerships there with all companies. And we have had uh, you know, partnerships with the, our university system in California, where PP was sponsoring research for new technology and new, finding new ways of fuel and so on. And the key thing, I think, is that government does not pick winners. That's the biggest mistake. If this is saying, okay, we're going to go and start putting money into a hydrogen highway, but not into plug-ins so that electric cars have any benefits. So the key thing is to stay out of that, not to pick winners, and to let the private sector and the people make that decision. Something is going to emerge eventually. What kind of a car is going to really uh, be the most popular? Yeah. Just as like it was, uh, um, you know, 100 years ago when they had the debates over electric cars versus, you know, uh, um, oil uh, fueled cars. Uh, there was a debate like this already 100 years ago. And the oil won because the oil companies were very strong and they campaigned, got together with the tire companies and with the car companies and created this kind of a, a interesting kind of a unit where they, they pushed and made all the cities, or a lot of the cities in, in, in America, rip out their railroads so that you had to use you know, uh, cars. But uh, the key thing is, is that you form partnerships and you don't villainize and you don't put anyone on the other side of the fence um, and, and also what's important is, I think, this gets back to the Prime Minister's question about how do you convince people uh, that it, you don't lose jobs. That question was there 100 years ago, too. Yep. I mean, if we had horses and wagons, the, the, you know, horse buggies, and they were pulling and they were delivering goods, they were driving people around, and then all of a sudden the car was produced. What, what, could you go now to the, to, the, to the manufacturers of these horse buggies and say, well, you're going to lose a lot of jobs, let's continue riding around with horses and with buggies, or do you go and, and start producing cars? So it's always when you switch over and you change that people are going to be scared. So that's why I think the art of communication and to convince people that there are a lot of jobs there. Every single time when we in California build a solar plant, there were jobs created. Every time where we weatherized any buildings, there were jobs created. So I think that uh, we, like for instance, SolarSime that produces you know, fuel, uh, uh, biofuel with algae, it's such a new idea, such a great concept. They immediately made a deal with the Navy that now the Navy is saying by, by 2020, half of their fleet ought to be powered by algae-based fuel. So they, they're making huge money. Mm -hmm. So all of those things really, in the end, can be very profitable and beneficial and create jobs and also be good for the economy. But there is one other issue uh, Prime Minister Ponte, Ponte brought up, and it's the issue of price. I mean, it's, it sounded so easy when you said, Governor, you know, just keep using your whirlpool or, or whatever, your jacuzzi, just put a solar panel. People in Romania, the only question they have, do we have sufficient cheap energy available? How is this uh, issue to be solved? What do you think? Well, you know, like, I think that the Prime Minister knows better how to solve the problems in Romania. I was the leader of, uh, uh, for seven years in California, so I had to figure out how to lead California and how to make Californians convinced. So we all have the same, look, we all have the same challenges. The key thing is to bring the people in. I think what the point of my speech was that there was, don't think that the national governments or governments in general are gonna be able to solve every problem. You got to bring the people in, you got to make people partners. If you think about the greatest and the most successful movements in the world, 
are all based on grassroots separation and people power. If it's the civil rights movement in the United States, it did not come from Washington. If it's the anti-apartheid movement, it did not come from the capital of South Africa. It came from the people. If you talk about the, uh, the, the, the suffrage movement, where women got the right to, to, to vote in America, it was a ground level operation. If it was the independence movement in India, it did not come from the daily. It came from the people power. It, you need the people power. You need to bring in people. You need to tell people. That's why I said, you got to make this whole movement this uh, energy movement and this uh, environmental movement, this crusade, you got to make it hip, you got to make it sexy, you got to make it snappy so that young people respond to it rather than beating up on people all the time saying, you're driving a car with a big engine with eight cylinders, this is terrible, you're doing something terrible for the world. No, let's tell that person how he can choose the next car and all the new technology that is available and inspire them to go in that direction rather than making them feel guilty and beating up on people all the time. So it's just a different approach, and I think having promoted fitness for four decades, and like I said, we were very successful with the fitness crusade, that now there's more gymnasiums in the world than ever before, there's, there's more food supplement companies than ever before, more weight uh, training equipment manufacturers than ever before, more conventions and more championships and all of this stuff because we were successful. I think the way we communicated was really the art of the whole thing. I think we have to do the same thing also with the environmental movement. We've got to communicate the right way and we've got to make people partners in the movement. That's interesting because there is one other warning voice uh, that keeps saying it's too late, we can't make the turnaround, we won't make it in time to change our attitude. What do you think? Are you optimistic that we can make it or is it Well, too let late? me tell you something. I'll just give you a little example. My kids always left the light on when they left the room. And I said to them, I said, every time you leave the light on, I'm going to take one light bulb out of, the, out of your room. <laughs> By the time they did it six days in a row, all the light bulbs were gone and the room was dark. And they were freaking out at night because it was dark when they were little. And uh, immediately it changed. They started turning off the lights and we changed their habit. The same is also with the shower. When they sat on their stool inside the shower and they were having the water come down for 20 minutes, kids love that. Well, I put a, a, a special device in there that after five minutes, the hot water was gone. <laughs> They ran out of that shower so quickly and they stopped that, 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 that long shower. So you can change the habit, you just have to figure out how to do it. And it starts already with the education of the children, it starts what you're doing in, a, in, in, in the classroom, in school, what you tell the students at the university. These are our future leaders and that's why I'm you know, having a panel discussion later on with the students here in Vienna. Uh, in order to include them and to let them know that they are the leaders of the future. And we got to go and, and, and appeal to them and talk to them and ask them to be part of this movement. Let me just uh, ask you one last question on uh, maybe your thoughts uh, about the U.S. energy policy. I mean, the public uh, one, you know? US, U.S. energy policy, I would say there is no policy. <laughs> It's embarrassing. It is. Because the fact of the matter is there are a few things that the United States Congress and the President have to work together on that needs to be done very badly. Energy and environment is one of those issues that has not been resolved and has not been worked on. I mean, if you think about that, California now has 35% of renewables, which is 20% of renewables, including hydro, because we don't count hydro, so it's 15%, so 35%. And the rest of the United States is maybe two and a half percent of renewables. So that's embarrassing. It's ludicrous. I mean, they can do much better than that. We don't know in the United States where we will get our f uh, energy in the future. If it will be from nuclear power, if it will be from renewables, if it will be from offshore drilling and onshore drilling, or you know, or, or which direction we are going to go. There is no direction yet. And so I think that if the, the United States, if Congress is successful in one of those issues in the near future. And it could be immigration at this point because they're negotiating immigration and reform um, into how to deal with the illegal immigrants in America. 
if they break through and get a victory going there and work together, Democrats and Republicans, I think that that could be the opening of, uh, opening the can of worm of working together on other issues. And I think that energy will be one of the next issues they will address. I think that they were very close the last time. It's, it's not complicated. You just have to give everyone a little bit. So those people that want to have you know, the nuclear power, you let them have the thing. Those people that want to drill more, you want to let, let them do it. But those people that want to have renewable energy and get more subsidies from the government, you also let them have their victory. So the key thing is everyone can declare victory in the end, and we will be energy secure and energy independent in America, and we will have an energy program or policy that will reduce finally our greenhouse gases and not make America, along with China, the biggest polluters in the world. It's absolutely essential to reduce our pollution, our, uh, the amount of greenhouse gases that we put out there every day. I hope President Obama is watching in and listening right now, so he gets a message from you today. He, he, he's in the right place. President Obama is in the right place. He wants to go in the right direction, but he also remembers this old saying, it takes, takes two to tango, and uh, so alone he cannot do it. So Congress has to show also some leadership. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you that at this point, Governor Schwarzenegger has to leave us. He has a lot of uh, appointments, uh, important talks behind the scene, behind the stage, but we will keep on discussing here on stage. It was wonderful to have you on this podium. Great to be able to ask you some questions. Thank you very I much. I want to say thank you very much to the panelists. I know that each and every one of you are very important people. You have, you're working tirelessly on all the different things that you're doing and to take a day out and to come here to Vienna from far away and to be part of this very important discussion and to share some of your uh, insight on this subject, I think is very important. So thank you to all of you very much. Let's give them a big, big hand for their great participation here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Governor Schwarzenegger, thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> you know what? As this chair was warmed up by the governor, just take it. It makes it easier for me to reach out to all of you. Take the middle place here. And uh, let me continue on this discussion with you, uh, Ms. Savan. You seem actually to be... Um, hold on that for the translation. You seem actually... Uh, to be rather optimistic on the capacity of regions and federated states um, to reach the current freeze in negotiations on climate change and sustainable energies. And the question is, why do you think that regions can be more productive than states in all these issues? Uh, sorry, my, uh, I speak with you in French because yes. uh, French is my uh, French ling language is my culture. Mesdames et messieurs, je, je souhaite m'exprimer en, en français parce que c'est vrai que la langue française est, est ma culture et qu'à partir de là, c'est ce qui fait aussi la force de notre euh, rassemblement. Je préside l'Assemblée des régions d'Europe depuis quelques années maintenant et j'ai su convaincre parce que comme euh, le gouverneur Arnold Schwarzenegger, mon arme c'est la conviction et la conviction qui a été la mienne c'est de dire qu'au travers des régions, on avait l'occasion, la possibilité d'avancer ensemble et de faire, au travers de nos échanges d'expériences, des bonnes pratiques, de mettre ensemble euh, nos régions pour travailler. Les échecs de Copenhague, les échecs des différents sommets de la Terre nous ont démontré que les régions, les États fédérés, 
pouvaient travailler ensemble et mener à bien euh, les propositions que nous, faisons, que nous ferions. On l'a entendu tout à l'heure, que ce soit au travers de l'intervention euh, du président de la Commission européenne, M. Barroso, que ce soit au travers de l'intervention de M. le directeur général de, de, de l'ONU, que ce soit au travers de l'intervention d'Arnold Schwarzenegger, quand le politique et les experts marchent ensemble, notre conviction est de dire « nous pouvons faire progresser toutes les propositions que nous faisons ». Alors donc moi je suis convaincue et je, je tiens à informer l'assistance puisque je préside euh, le bureau du R20. Arnold Schwarzenegger et l'ensemble du bureau m'ont fait cette confiance. C'est que nous allons nous rendre très bientôt au Niger pour mettre en place l'Assemblée des régions africaines. Nous revenons du Brésil où nous avons travaillé à la mise en place également de la mise en place de l'Assemblée des régions d'Amérique latine. Vous avez ici dans l'assistance le président de l'Assemblée des régions d'Asie du Sud-Est qui, à partir de là, c'est sur chaque continent, nous avons une Assemblée des régions qui permette de confronter euh, nos, 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 nos expériences. Nous sommes convaincus qu'effectivement, comme l'a dit le gouverneur Arnold Schwarzenegger, notre arme, c'est la conviction. Oui, les régions ont un rôle majeur et je suis convaincu que nous, gouvernements, plus nous irons vers euh, cette force de conviction, et vous savez, je n'ai qu'un proverbe, c'est que l'union fait la force. Alors j'ai entendu beaucoup de, 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 de techniques, notamment Philippe, euh, Renaud Nissan, euh, mais vous savez, monsieur le Premier ministre de Roumanie, puisque l'ensemble des régions roumaines sont membres de l'Assemblée des régions d'Europe, comment nous avançons vers vous pour vous donner toutes nos propositions, pour vous faire partager tous nos projets qui fonctionnent ailleurs. Et je suis sûre que dans quelques années, je suis un peu comme, euh, euh, j'allais dire, Arnold Schwarzenegger, il a fait de la publicité pendant plus de 20 ans pour les centres de fitness. C'est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, même dans les plus petits villages, vous avez ces centres-là, le plus dans tous les hôtels, quand vous arrivez, vous prenez votre clé et vous dites, le fitness se trouve à quel étage ben, J'aimerais bien que dans 10 ans, c'est pas très loin, mais c'est très court quand même, on puisse dire que grâce aux régions dans le monde, et notamment grâce au R20, on a pu avancer. Thank you very much. Definitely for this uh, way of action, we need a very professional PR consultant. Um, but I think they're on the way, aren't they? They are doing quite good work on this. Uh, putting up a good image for the whole thing. Uh, Mr. Nobel, you're holding a very promising name, of course. Uh, can you please outline for us uh, your intentions and goals to, to implement the Sustainability Award by Nobel Sustainability Trust? Yes. Well, First, I think it's appropriate to say, uh, explain a little bit what we, who we are, the Nobel Sustainability Trust. It is a, a foundation that is uh, founded by four members of the Nobel family. And uh, a lot of you might think that the, um, the Alfred Nobel is the only Nobel around, but he actually had two brothers that were just as much uh, entrepreneurs and scientists and, and, uh, as he was. And um, the four of us who have formed this foundation, we're all descendants from Ludwig and Robert Nobel, who had a, and built a tremendous career in, uh, in Russia and uh, Azerbaijan before the Russian Revolution. And uh, Ludwig, in particular, he stood for sustainability in all his work, in his own way. And he vertic vertically integrated his company. And among the companies he had was Bra Nobel, which actually was an oil company. But at that time, before the revolution, it was the second largest oil company in the world. Then, of course, the rest is history. Everything was confiscated and so on and so forth. We decided to pick up this legacy of sustainability and take it uh, forward in order to uh, achieve what we all are trying to do here. And um, one thing we are doing, we are having three three um, platforms that we rest on. And the first one is, um, is the Sustainability Award, as you mentioned. This award, I mean, we heard uh, Governor Schwarzenegger talking a lot about 
people and people's action, people's movement. And we sincerely believe in those, uh, in those movements, but we also know, and we all know here, that we all have to be motivated, we have to be inspired in order to, to stretch ourselves to do more and to do things we couldn't think we couldn't do before. So we have then decided to implement the Sustainability Award by Nobel Sustainability Trust, of course. Um, it is also, uh, again, appropriate to say that we, we have, are not connected at all to the Nobel Prize Foundation in Stockholm. That's a totally different operation, but we share uh, a mutual respect and we have a, uh, an ongoing communication always. Uh, they cannot implement a prize in sustainability because they are stopped by the last will and, and, and testament of Alfred Nobel. We all know that there is a prize in economy that is today called the Nobel Prize in economy, but it isn't. It is a prize given out by the Swedish National Bank in the honor and memory of Alfred Nobel. So, but, so uh, excuse yeah. me if I just jump in here. Uh, so what you are thinking about is to uh, put a little bit of competitiveness into the whole story to motivate people to be even more innovative, even more foregoing on this issue. Is that the thought behind the prize? This is what we are hoping to achieve, of course, because we believe that this will move our positions forwards and hopefully a lot more, a lot faster than, uh, like they are doing for writers, the Nobel Prize is doing for writers, scientists, uh, doctors, um, peace uh, lovers, and so on. So I think this is, um, it, it will be an important award. We are uh, going to give it out in Denmark. And you can, of course, uh, I am Swedish. Why should we give it out in Denmark? Well, we have chosen Denmark because of all the countries in the world, and I know that these feelings are also shared by the governor. We, uh, Denmark is the greenest country of them all, really. And they have gone, come a long, long way. And just uh, let us know how does the cooperation with the R20 uh, work in the end? Yeah. Well, we are very happy to be uh, a partner with R20. And we share their philosophy of, of move, move this, this uh, technology, technology transfer that you need to put down all the way down to the regions rather than on a, on a national basis. So we share those, uh, um, those thoughts and we work together intensely in, in a number of, of different uh, projects. All right, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point I have to tell you that uh, Prime Minister Ponta has to leave us. Thank Prime Minister, you. thank you very much for your insights and for being here. Right. We have two more persons to ask, and I would like to turn to Mr. Johnson first to introduce you and uh, let everybody know that um, your remarkable experiences as an economist. Can you answer us the following question? What are the main needed drivers uh, to increase funding in renewable energy programs, or in other words, where can the money come from? Yes, I think this is the, really the very, very large question that we have to address. If we don't have the money, we won't make the difference and we have to mobilize the, that funding. I think there's several things about it. First of all, we have a bigger global financial sector than we've ever seen and yet it has become self-satisfied. It has become a casino where it bets on itself. We have to find ways of driving money from the financial sector into the real economy to real investments. That will take two things. It will take enlightened public policy on the one hand, but it will also take, uh, at the local level, good quality investable projects and programs. So we have to do two things. We have to increase the supply of funds but we equally have to look at the demand side and build up the quality of investments. What I'm really encouraged about is that we have for so long rested on international treaties, which have rapidly become the least interested country agreeing with the least committed country. With the R20 and with other initiatives, we have a possibility of building up from the bottom 
high quality investable projects and programs that I think will attract institutional investors interested in long term investment. So we have to do two things. The economics are clear. If we add in all of the ec what economists call externalities, the real cost that it's going to be in the long term, it makes eminent sense to go for a no carbon global world. It's a good economic proposition. The sad thing is it's not a good financial proposition. We have to bring the two together. That sounds uh, like an interesting project. Mr. Keller. as you were mentioning in your highly appreciated speech, I mean, everybody was totally on fire after your speech, uh, and totally enthusiastic about what you presented, but of course in your speech there was some money issue as well. And he said, we, we need the funds, we need a lot of money to put this all into reality. Now we hear there's the idea, there's, there are the models, but mm -hmm. how, how do we put that into reality? For sure vision is good. Oh, you need a mic. For sure vision is good, but cash, cash also helps and technology. And it is exactly what the former speaker just said. Let price matters. When you cost and price things properly, industry responds. Right now, we're not doing that. We're not putting in those environmental and social costs to the way we're generating and using energy. And the example I gave of the United States, the switch from coal to gas within one year, 220 gigawatts, it's because of price. It will be the same if, if we were able to add these externalities. You'll see that alternatives become competitive. How do we get the political will to do that? I just wanted to emphasize that the pricing issue matters uh, significantly. How to get the money? This is why we insist in the Secretary General's initiative, and uh, that's the drive of the Secretary General, we need business models. Public policy matters. Our role in the UN and the World Bank in making, in advocating for and assisting countries with technical support to create the right policy environment to attract those investments is going to be an issue. Second, we're looking at what we call de-risking models. We have a task force now with the European Investment Bank, Bank of America, World Economic Forum, and what they call the Green Growth Alliance, G2A2, looking at innovative business models that can de-risk energy investments. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the details, but we have a group looking at this. In Rio, we got a lot of pledges, over 50 billion, and more will come. How do we make those pledges go into real projects is a tough job. You need to teach the countries how to do the policies, especially the poor countries. You need to bring the business partners together. There are a number of companies, Siemens, GE, and others who want to come in, but you need that risk insurance, and they're de-risking instruments before they come in. Aid will be good, but it's not enough. And so I just want to agree that um, we need to create the business environment and the business case for a number of these solutions before the cash will come for, uh, together with the technologies. Yes, we will, um, we will have our own podium on the issue of finance in this, this afternoon with a number of experts uh, discussing on that topic. But I want to come back to Mr. Royce now because I interrupted you when you just said topic number two is. No, I think what uh, we didn't discuss sufficiently here and you just uh, talked about it is technology. We have to be aware that the share of 20 to 30 percent renewable in the mix is due to technology which we call first generation technology. To manage the whole transition period needs second and third generation. We have heard about algaes in biofuels, we have had other issues, but this needs huge amount of money and time. And uh, we are too much concentrating nowadays on giving subsidies in first generation technology. If we see what governments are doing today, governmental spending, the biggest relative governmental spending of the key industrial countries was in not 11, not 10, was in 1980. This was 12% of governmental spending went into energy. Today it's 4%. At the same time, we are putting 88 billion US in terms of subsidies in short-term supportive measurements in managing this change. And what I want to address is that we have to, if we really take it serious, besides all what we discussed here, all these efforts, 
We have to think, what does it need to manage a renewable area with more than 50% share of our energy? What does it mean in terms of investment and where does it come from? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question as well. I think, Mr. Junkeller, and I want to uh, go over to you for a, uh, a one more time, maybe the last time on this round. But what I would like to know is, um, Mr. Royce mentioned in the beginning, we don't only have to look at uh, all these innovative uh, measures, strategies, everything that's new, but we also need the security and safety of uh, energy supply throughout the ongoing time. So how much risk can we take? When Mr. Royce and others, if you listen to the panel carefully, have given us the reality check. Mm -hmm. With our best of intentions, all the analysis I have seen, this is a long transition. That's why Governor's point was uh, relevant. All technologies must be on the table. Give countries the opportunity, the information they need to develop that transition and gradually decarbonize energy systems. I know some would want, i, I give you an example. Uh, when we started debating two years ago, should we push for a 2.5% annual improvement in efficiency? Some groups told me that's not ambitious enough. Do 6%. I went to the expert and industry. They tried to calculate for me what 3% meant in Europe. If Europe pushed 3% energy efficiency improvement, the amount of investment they need would be bigger than what they did in even building the current infrastructure. It's a big move. Energy touches on everything. So I am confident that what we started doing here and with the leadership of the Secretary General and the President of the World Bank, we build that political momentum on the one level. We also build the partnership sub-national, bottom up, and at the same time, incentivize. Incentivize decarbonization help people change their habits about how they use energy, simple examples given by governor and others, but also pricing, we come back. Let us reflect the real price. What he said about subsidy, the International Energy Agency estimates now it's 400, over 400 billion a year we're putting into subsidies of other energy sources. In renewables, 50. Just level the playing field. People will make the choices, but we reflect the real costs of carbon and greenhouse gas emissions in all technologies. The markets will change. The companies will innovate. That's the confidence we have. It will take time. Part of my new job in July is to take this up full time. It's not an easy one, but I am very confident I have partners that have been on this panel and elsewhere. We will do it, and that's the drive uh, that, that uh, really motivates me to say, hey, leave your comfortable job now and take this one and, and push it at all levels. That sounds wonderful to have you here, especially I think the whole thing will be in Vienna, so yes. we'll have you here a lot of time. And yes, ma'am. It will be great to have a lot of talks with you on this issue. Thank you. And I would like uh, to go back to the auto industry once more for one question. Um, how, Mr. Schulz, uh, will the path be to what you told us about emission-free mobility? I mean. Uh, are we talking in decades, in years? And how far is the infrastructure actually that needs to be set up for the whole thing? First of all, I think uh, what is really important is that, uh, as uh, Mr. Royce said, we have to, uh, to commit and develop technology and really put money on the table in order to, to make it applicable at a large scale. And uh, if you look at Renault Nissan, we invested 4 billion euros, 4 billion euros to develop the zero emission vehicle technology. We have a lineup of uh, uh, four electric vehicles. We'll have a fifth electric vehicle available this year. So, I mean, and this was one of the commitments we took last year in the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. So, clearly, it will take decades to substitute uh, the vehicles uh, through new technologies, for sure. The penetration rate will, uh, will, be, will be slow. But nevertheless, we have to start now. What we say is that by 2020, we could have 10%, 10% of the new vehicles sold worldwide, which could be uh, electric vehicles, 10%. So it will be 100 million vehicles in the year 2020, so let's say 10 million vehicles. We will have the manufacturing capability. 
we have the engineering uh, 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 here. I mean, we have the product. You can see, you can test drive the products. It will not replace the conventional uh, oil and the conventional diesel and gasoline cars. But, and this will be part of the transition. And I would say, I, I have to say also that what is very important with R20 is that we have to implement and to accelerate the implementation of the best practices, of the best available technologies. We have highly efficient and clean cars technology available in many regions of the world, in Europe, in the US, because together we develop clean fuels for clean cars. And we have to make sure that we will have the fuel quality levels available everywhere in order to make it possible to introduce those technologies tomorrow and not wait for 10 or 20 years. And this could be a tremendous progress to reduce CO2 emissions, to reduce exhaust emissions, and to be more fuel efficient. So we will save money for everybody. The, uh, the oil bill in Europe is 1 billion euro per day. 1 billion euro per day. And I mean, this is also something that we can, uh, that all of us uh, can see at the pump every day. And this will, this will be true everywhere in the world. So we have to work together in order really to support the transition and to make it happen. Sounds like a good uh, final statement for this first round, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not absolutely sure about the time right now, because I think my watch is a little bit, uh, uh, she's on strike. 12.30. Thank you very much. That is a time when I should tell you that you all are now invited to lunch by Rewe. And I'm looking forward to present you a number of best practice models after lunch with a number of very interesting guests here on the podium. See you later. Thank you for now.